Hey, everybody. I am back again with my leader series during this COVID crisis. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. I want to welcome everybody who is joining us for this conversation from all over the world. And I know you recognize the face next to me on the screen here. This is, of course, David Malpass, the uh, President of the World Bank Group. David, thank you so much for taking time to have this conversation um, really about where, where we're headed during this crisis for the poorest countries in the world, for the countries that you, you serve and work with at the World Bank Group. I know there's a lot of interest in it. Thanks for taking the time to do it. Super, thanks, Raj. Uh, you, uh, it's, it's really important. You know, the challenges are huge, so I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk about it. Thanks. Yeah, you know, you had a report you issued a couple of weeks ago on uh, economic prospects, and you had a line in there uh, where you said, this is gonna be the deepest recession since World War II. And I think particularly about you know, our community here at DevX and the people you serve in the World Bank Group, the poorest countries in the world, what, what do you think it's gonna look like for them? You, you, uh, you're you on the phone with a lot of presidents of these countries and finance ministers. What are you hearing from them about how this recession is actually playing out in the lowest resource parts of the world? It, it's very tough. There's the combination of the health uh, crisis itself. And a lot of countries don't have much capacity to directly Take care of people that are that are that are that are hit with COVID. Uh, then it, it also uh, um, diverts attention from the other health issues that are going on. The the fight against malaria, for example, uh, and then a, a third level uh, is the uh, people out of their jobs, which you know has a whole set of collateral damage. Uh, it means that nutrition isn't as good. It means that girls uh, aren't going to school, and you know one of the what a uh, high priority is to get boys and girls to be going to school because it uh, it provides the education for the future. It may help delay marriage and pregnancy for for uh, uh, for for girls and for adolescents. Uh, so those are important issues. And then a, a third that I or a, another layer of this that. I don't want to forget is the food. Uh, the food distribution systems have been really uh, challenged by this, including uh, by the locust. And so we have a combination of circumstances that's hitting literally hundreds of millions of people, maybe probably a billion people uh, being severely disadvantaged. Yeah, and I think when you think about the, the nature of a lot of the economies that are lower resource, that are the low and middle income countries, a lot of them are dependent on tourism. They're dependent on commodity exports, um, remittances. You know, they're in a different position than maybe some of the richer countries in the world. Is there, is there the likelihood or the chance that we're going to see the world economy as it gets out of this recession become even more unequal, where the poorest countries in the world really are on their back foot because their traditional ways of growing aren't there for them as people aren't going back to tourism and travel as quickly or as export commodities just don't you know, get repriced in the way that they would need to see them, see them go up? I'm worried about that. I think that's already happening, the inequality. And we, you know, you can see a simple measure of that just in the stock markets and the bond markets of the world being being a uh, a differentiation between the 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 haves and the have-nots, if you want to, if you want to call it that way. And the techniques that are being used in the advanced countries, meaning fiscal policy and then the central banks buying the assets of uh, that are that that are that are um, more the assets of of people with means uh, uh, corporate bonds for example municipal bonds and so on uh, that that further concentrates the, uh, uh, the 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 wealth and the income uh, now I I want to say on a positive side there can be some evening of this if uh, the digital uh, if the digital divide can narrow, meaning if you have more uh, connectivity in developed in developing countries in the poorest countries, which is being that is being pushed by this crisis, that's that can be good. Uh, and then very importantly is the the developing countries allowing their economies to shift. So, for example, shift away from dependence on tourism and remittances and shift to things that people find from the bottom up that are productive. So that's one of our, our challenges is to uh, listen to the countries and see what's going to work as an alternative to the old system. We're going into the post-pandemic system. Yeah, there's this idea that in a crisis, there's also an opportunity. 
And I wonder, what are you hearing from countries when you talk to them about this idea that you could you know, take this moment to maybe reduce gas subsidies um, and maybe focus more on green energy or, as you say, digitize and uh, re reduce your reliance on single exports? Are you, are, are, do you feel like there's an opportunity here to take up that new model? And is that something you're really promoting at the World Bank? We are promoting it. We've, we've wanted it to come uh, from countries. Each country is different in what, what the opportunities are for them and what the costs are. So you might say, I mean, to oversimplify this, if you look at each country and say, what's the most expensive subsidy that you've, you've been doing for an existing monopoly that you could cut out, uh, that would be a way to try to approach the problem, to use to, uh, to, to find a path forward that's less expensive uh, in terms of the distortions. And so we're doing that. What, one example is on the energy side, many countries have been paying a lot to subsidize low cost gasoline, low cost diesel fuel, trying to, to, trying to help them move to a different system where, where those, uh, th those are more market priced that's that's an opportunity given the the low uh, uh, oil price and gasoline prices that are available now. Uh, but I th I think it that what it's taking is the political will in countries and also some to some degree the actual capacity to both analyze but then make the shift. For example, let's say you're a country that's been used to having very high tariffs on the importation of rice. And that ends up being a, an expensive subsidy for your local domestic rice farmers because it it uses up the water of the country uh, and it uh, doesn't it's not a it's not uh, the most productive use of those assets. Um, that that's just very hard for countries to break through and and break to a new system. Uh, and yet. The benefits to the people of the country are immediate. They get a lower they in that in, in that example they'll get a lower rice price and less expensive government if if they can move away from that kind of subsidized activity. So all of yep. these, you, you know, there are a host of examples. We're we're working closely with countries to see what's feasible. In a way, though, it feels like the world's going in the opposite direction of that. You know, if you look at a lot of the debate as this pandemic has taken hold, in richer countries, there's a sense, hey, we, we be, need to be able to produce PPE ourselves and medicine wow. ourselves. And there seems like there may be a trend toward advanced economies wanting to bring manufacturing back. I mean, this was already the case maybe even before the pandemic, perhaps accelerated, which could also be a hit to, to countries that used to see their growth model dependent on light manufacturing, you know, bringing the you know, making sneakers and you know tennis shoes and, and clothes that used to happen in, in China and it's gone to Southeast Asia and then maybe eventually to Africa. Maybe maybe none of that will actually happen and, and manufacturing will go back to the rich countries. How do you see that in your own projections? Uh, uh, very much a, uh, uh, a, a, a challenge. We were worried about people looking at the uh, uh, or doing export restrictions on food, uh, as was done in 2008 and 2009. Uh, fortunately, there, there, that hasn't been so widespread. For example, Vietnam initially had a ban on ex export of rice, but then discontinued that. Uh, and so, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm, I, there are some. Uh, uh, less bad things going on in the world. We haven't seen the food export restrictions uh, before. But your point is good of uh, uh, if countries try to really protect uh, parts of the manufacturing sector on the theory that they get manufacturing jobs, but the cost of that is, is large, it may not be the direction that the people of the country are best uh, wanting wanting to go, uh, and that I I, th I think these these are huge challenges. It may be that the world had become too dependent on exports from China, for example. This is a and but but the 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 global markets have been diversifying so that there are many exporters of many different kinds of products, and I think history shows us that's uh, that's economically effective if there can be a diversity of sellers into the market. One of the challenges for us for development is to have countries have options and have development 
options that uh, that make this possible. Do you, when you think about your own view on this, how radical should we be in this moment? And maybe how radical are you in this moment? Because some of the things you're saying sound pretty pretty dramatic, right? You're talking about the deepest recession since World War II. Um, and there are a lot of people who are pushing for this moment to be kind of a global green new deal kind of moment. Like let's really remake the global economy, remake the way we produce energy, the kinds of jobs of the future. You talked about the digital revolution. Um, do you see yourself kind of more on that side of it that we need to come out of this with a very new, aggressive, radical vision for development? Or is it a more of an iterative change where the pandemic is a bit of a bump along a path we already had established? Um, Raj, the I don't know the answer to that. Um, I we can hope that there'll be leaps forward by various countries, uh, and uh, uh, we can work toward that. My own thought is there are possibilities where that will happen. For example, let's say a country allows uh, a digital connectivity that that is done effectively in a way that penetrates into cities and rural areas and allows education. India is doing something where they're allowing some uh, uh, diagnostic medical diagnosis by by remote from you know from a digital platform that you can imagine that being quite effective meaning a doctor looks or a nurse looks at a child and can see from looking uh, what an initial diagnosis might be and then decide which children need to go see a doctor which ones need an, a, a new kind of uh, uh, or better nutrition and what the education process can be in that so I, th I think there are ways that this can help facilitate some of the leaps. Uh, so I mentioned digital. An another one is, uh, you know, the, uh, the evolution of, uh, of uh, electric, uh, electricity generation that's much less carbon intensive. Uh, and I think that will go a distance toward the green revolution that we would like to see. Um, I, and I think there are other areas. Well, let, I mean, I'm I'm interested in many of them. One is trade facilitation. Uh, one one thing that's been so frustrating for development uh, is the barriers on borders, cross borders. Uh, and so, if this can be used as an opportunity to bring down some of those borders, uh, that that would be uh, an important step forward. But to kind of get at the core of your question, can this be a, a, a big inflection point upward for development? Uh, I, I hope so, but I'm not seeing that at the moment. Uh, and we're working country by country to try to make that possible. Thanks for, for addressing that. I just want to remind all, of, all the folks who are following us from around the world online, feel free to submit your questions in the chat. I'll try to weave them into the conversation as much as I can. Maybe we could shift gears just for a second, David, and get to the issue of debt. Um, I heard you recently talking about the fact that one of the reasons the World Bank Group had to jump into action around this pandemic was that the capital markets for a lot of borrowing countries were kind of frozen. Is that still the case? How do you see the, the picture you know, from the perspective of a, of a low-income low country that's trying to borrow? Is the World Bank still a critical stopgap, or are the markets now more normalized? Uh, it, it's a differentiated market. So in trade finance, for example, the IFC has been been doing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of expansion or making available capital for because that dried up uh, for for a while and it's only coming back gradually. So what we see is some countries are back able to have market access in in terms of finance. Uh, but many of the poorest countries are not. Uh, uh, and that has to do with just the recognition of the market that there's going to be this debt overhang. It's going on actually also in developed countries. So the higher rated bonds uh, have, have a bid. Uh, they, you know, there are buyers, uh, but the lower rated bonds don't because the market's making that differentiation. So we can work with countries to provide the most needed uh, uh, core services, both public and private, uh, in order to uh, allow activity to continue. So that's actually a relatively low cost way of providing assistance is just helping the, the companies in a country uh, have the short term financing needed for imports 
for example, can help a lot with food shortages. And, and we're trying to do that. Is your feeling we're going to get out of that period relatively soon as these lockdown stay-at-home orders go away? I mean, I, I'm reminded of the fact that you were the chief economist at Bear Stearns right before the financial crisis. So you've seen up close how a systemic risk can take down an entire financial system. Are there systemic risks here that poor countries need to be aware of or we should be aware of? Is there anything out there that sort of you worry could actually lead to something more systemic like what we saw in 08? Uh, there are differences now in terms of bank capitalization, not so far being under pressure as in the in the developed countries. In the developing countries, some of the bank capitalization is under pressure, and so that that creates some of the systemic risks that that we have to uh, watch out for. Uh, but but I think the uh, uh, the bigger issue at, we are, we already touched on the the uh, the livelihoods of people are being severely disrupted and I'm, I'm 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 don't I'm not sure those will come back very fast if you think about in East Africa for example where the locust has hit uh, that means that uh, that people that are that uh, are that are dependent on livestock, are in in a very difficult situation because there's not the crops to feed to the livestock. So that's one example that will take uh, years, I'm afraid, uh, to come back. We can help with that by providing seeds or by setting up systems that allow people to start growing for the next crop season. So that's a practical uh, uh, type of uh, recovery process that I think is important. Uh, also, one other thing I'll mention is the the, the uh, country's ability to allow a resolution of failures, uh, meaning if a company fails, do you try to keep it on life support and spend a lot of money trying to do that? Or do you have a legal means where the assets can be can be transferred to uh, to people that can use them more? And it's a, bankruptcy processes are very important to facilitate the recovery from a crisis. Yeah, great, great points. And I want to get back into some of those, especially around poverty figures in a second, but just staying on debt for a moment. I know that you have uh, you know, been part of this process where the G20 countries have put a moratorium or a suspension of debt payments starting May 1st. And I think they last for about six months and then those debt payments are then owed. Eight, um, eight months, yeah. Eight months, okay. Yeah. So how, how do you see the um, this issue of debt? I know you have spoken out against the World Bank canceling debts or suspending its own debts. And a lot of countries maybe are over indebted at this point. And, and there's even talk of off balance sheet debt from Chinese entities like the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, how do you see this overall picture of debt? Are we at a, at a precipitous moment where maybe there is too much debt for many of the poor countries in the world and it could tip in the wrong direction? Uh, there, there is definitely too much debt for some of the countries. The World Bank did a report uh, before the pandemic on the four waves of debt that uh, that described and quantified uh, some of the ex excess indebtedness and the implications of that. Um, but and and so I'll mention s several points. One is w through a moratorium. The it's it's for the poorest countries, meaning. 75 Ida countries plus Angola. Uh, the, these are countries that uh, uh, that don't have access to markets by and large, uh, and and uh, will benefit from the resources that they are able to save during the moratorium. So that's important. That the G20 endorsed that as a concept uh, and and requested that there be comparable treatment from the private sector. That's important, and that still hasn't come about and I think there's more work that needs to be done on that. As You're talking about from, commercial lenders, big institutions that, that lend money to governments. That's right. So if you're a, a, a bank or an investment bank or an insurance company or others that have lent to the poorest countries, uh, given the pandemic, uh, they're, they're, they need to look at uh, also providing a moratorium on debt payments. Otherwise, the assistance that's put in by development agencies like the World Bank or like the, the government of the, of the UK and, and others, uh, that goes to pay the debt service rather than going to the people of the country. 
Now, as far as the, the, the World Bank itself participating, the difficulty with that uh, is the, the, uh, the, the repayments that are, that are received by the World Bank are, in, are very quickly recycled to the poorest countries. And so if you begin to stop the repayment process, it severely undermines the ability of the institution to make net positive flows to the poorest countries. And so I, I don't think it's a direction that, that we want to go. It would also undermine the, the credit rating and the, borrow, the borrowing power of the, uh, of the multilateral institutions. So I think a better way to go is to look at, as, as the initiative is set out to do, to look at the official bilateral assistance that's been provided by the, let's be candid, the richer countries uh, to the poorer countries and allow that moratorium. And that the initiative seems to be going very well. Most of the developing countries have initiated the discussion with their creditors and, and uh, requested this moratorium. And in, by and large, in, uh, in almost all cases, the creditor countries and their, their entities, including the Chinese uh, entities, which is very important, have, are allowing uh, that uh, moratorium. So that part's going well. I think quite a bit more work on the commercial creditor side, meaning the wealthier banks and uh, uh, asset managers uh, need to take a look at this initiative and, and participate. And who's leading that effort? Is that is that you and Kristalina Georgieva? Are you on the phone with you know bank uh, CEOs asking them to to take a hard look at these questions? Who's leading it? Um, the the G20 called for it, endorsed it, and as did the the uh, the committees of the IMF and the World Bank. So there's there's a, a broad international consensus on doing it. Uh, the the uh, uh, the IIF, the Institute for International Finance, has tried to work on it, but uh, uh, is still looking to make progress. They have they they have a, a broad membership around the world from the creditors, and so one of the challenges here is the benefits of this go, flow to the to the debtor countries, the poorest people of the world, which is. Uh, you know, uh, billions of uh, of people benefiting from it, but uh, the 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 um, the moratorium itself would be the acceptance by the the uh, asset managers that they don't need to take payment this year, uh, and that's been the 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 hurdle. So it's being pushed, I think, in the uh, by the global community uh, as a as a, uh, a major helpful. Uh, step for the poorest for the poorest countries, um, and I'll make one more point. I think it's in the long term in the interest of the creditors uh, to do this because they'll end up with better clients uh, if they can get if they can help uh, get through this uh, pandemic crisis. Uh, you know, we are dealing with a with a focused, uh, uh, very deep downturn. And so if you can help your customers get through that, then you'll have a better customer on the other side. So I'm hoping that logic will take hold better in the private sector creditors. I've heard some people, their challenge to the World Bank, they tell me is the World Bank could do more, it could go bigger effectively. I know you've talked about $160 billion you're gonna put out there over the next like, 15 months or so. And then some more focus funding. I mean, 14 billion specific for COVID. And you just mentioned the credit worthiness of the bank is, of course, a key issue. Um, is, are these critics who say hey, the bank could draw more? You're, you're, you're triple A rated. You're a gold plated institution. You could borrow more from the markets while interest rates are low. You could do much more. Are they right? Is there are we missing an opportunity for the bank to do something even bigger than you're already doing? Uh, we've stretched the, uh, the, the capacity of the bank in the, in the commitments that we've made. And w w I'll, I'll add an additional point. There, there is some capacity constraint for the bank in doing the, the number of projects that we're now uh, undertaking. We were able to go very fast at the beginning of, in order to address the health crisis by setting up quickly through a fast track process uh, uh, programs in a hundred countries, but they were focused on, on the health 
crisis itself and the, the, the materials that were needed to fight that crisis. As you get into a broader program that's helping the country move forward, they're more complicated to, to work on. So I, I think the bank at this point is at, is, we're stretching the, the limits of our financing capacity and of our, uh, and of our, uh, uh, our own personnel and resources people working from home. But let me give you one number. The World Bank, you mentioned the $160 billion for the World Bank. We add to that another $80 billion from the rest of the multilateral development bank. So when you add in the European Investment Bank and the EBRD and the Asian Development Bank, you get another $80 billion. So the World Bank will be two thirds of the total. The rest will be another third. And that helps add up to a uh, meaningful, a, a, a very impactful, and I think transformational set of resources for the poorest countries. You recently talked about there might be a need to go back to the IDA replenishment, the last one, which just closed a few months ago, and look at increasing that number. Um, is that something you're, you're seriously pursuing? I know you wrote, you wrote a letter about this. Is there a number out there? I think it was 82 billion was in the last replenishment that you're, that, is there a number you have in mind of how much you think it needs to be topped up? Uh, uh, there's not a number. Uh, wh what we know is the resources or uh, the needs are more than the resources available. Ida just uh, uh, ag agreed on, and the, the donors very generously around the world uh, agreed on the replenishment in December of 2019. Uh, so I think the initiative would need to come from donors of recognizing this is a very good platform and we need, a, a, normally it would be three years before there would be another replenishment. So there would need to be a, a guidance and initiative from the donors uh, to, to make this work. All, all, all we've recognized so far is that the needs are really huge, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but the, the needs extend uh, globally uh, for the, for the uh, poorest countries. And also we're also challenging with, with the middle income developing countries. That means the ones that are somewhat uh, above the, the uh, uh, their national income is above the, the, the floor or above the lowest levels, but still are in need of substantial development assistance. So I, we'll see how that goes. It's, it's something that uh, donors can, can, can consider, uh, but I'll also, I, I wanna make the point that we have a lot of work to do ourselves uh, in order to have the capacity uh, that we're, we're already stretching our ability to provide the resources quickly. So that's what I'm most focused on. You're getting the money out when it's needed through, through the institutional process you have, the safeguards you have, et cetera. And good quality programs for the countries. That we're at the point where, we're, where each country has a different program. It's not the same as the health emergency that where you could say every, every country needed personal protective equipment and a certain amount of it, uh, or, you know, a base, a base level of, uh, of, of goods. Now we're at the point of, uh, of having different programs in different countries. And that's, that's a challenge for the countries. It's a challenge for the bank. Presumably a lot of it, though, would be social safety nets at this point. I know you've talked about, I think, 60 million people may be pushed into extreme poverty. First time we're going to see a big downturn since the Asian financial crisis. So presumably a lot of what you're hearing, I'm, I'm assuming, from governments is they want to make sure they have food and you know basic, uh, basic social safety net provision in place for their people. Uh, that's right. And that 60 million number was a month ago. As we look at it now, it looks more like 70 million to 100 million pushed into extreme poverty. And that's a that's a very challenging level. That's a level where the nutrition of your children is at stake and is not being adequate, for example, or health care is not non-existent. Uh, these are these are. Um, uh, a very difficult uh, situation that we that we actively want to help with. You're right. Governments are interested in social safety net, meaning can you provide cash transfers to these to people or food transfers, for example. Um, uh, and that, uh, but you know, it turns out to be difficult 
in a, in a world where there's not a connection, oftentimes between the government and the people, uh, it's hard hard to make those work. So uh, we are we are encouraging those. We're trying to work with countries, but the I think the reality is uh, it's hard to find the best or it's hard to find systems that really work for the poorest. They're almost by definition, they're cut off often from the marketplace and for their, from, their, uh, from their governments, from their healthcare systems. And so that means bridging that gap. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big gap to bridge. And boy, it would be something if we saw, you know, we're now at about 800 million people in the world living in extreme poverty. If we saw those numbers rise by 100 million or so, that would be a dramatic moment in history. I, I, we're, it, it's the, it's the first time in a while uh, that it's gone backwards, and that's very distressing. But gone yeah. backwards meaning gone higher. It had been on a, a downward trend for thirty years, um, uh, thanks in part, and I should note to the progress that was made in China, also the Green Revolution in uh, uh, in in India that uh, that helped with food, but a. a uh, a part of the reduction in poverty uh, took place in China as it as its incomes went up dramatically, and so those levels seem to be holding. Our latest numbers in the global economic uh, 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 report, the JEP report, was that uh, um, was that. China's uh, GDP growth might stay positive here in 2020, and so that's that that helps with the uh, with the floor of poverty. But as we look at other countries, uh, the all these problems that we are that we already went through the global recession, uh, the closures of the advanced economies has been pulling people downward into poverty, um, uh, and that's. That's the biggest challenge that we're facing right now. Your colleague, uh, the outgoing president of the EBRD, Chuck Obarty, he, he came out recently and said that he thinks we might need to revisit the Otis Agreement from 2015, which was meant to kind of modernize the world of development finance and increase domestic resources and increase overall resources for, for development finance. Do you, do you think we need to have a rethink, given that we're seeing poverty numbers going up, about just the fundamental way we finance development today? Uh, I, I think we have to take the pandemic itself as a uniquely bad event, uh, and so I don't know that that we that we have to go backward and and look at at at, at what was happening. What we know is that there has to be uh, uh, systems going forward that work in a world that uh, is less able to provide remittances to the poorest countries. As far as mobilizing finance. Uh, I think we have to figure out whether uh, whether whether markets can provide loans uh, in in an effective way to the poorest countries or even to the middle to the middle income countries. One of the things were that I think that I think is uh, very important is the transparency of the finances of the governments. I think there was a there was a uh, letting down of uh, of. Of standards, or of uh, and as more money flowed at lower and lower interest rates, there was there were terms that were set up in contracts uh, that were non-transparent. Uh, and so, one of the things we're trying to work on right now is greatly increased transparency of government finances uh, in around the world. Uh, this applies to developed countries as well as developing countries that the governments should disclose uh, where they're getting the finance, what the terms of the financing is, uh, and also what the project, what the expenditures are focused on. We're trying to monitor, for example, for the port, for the developing countries, uh, as as they have benefit from the moratorium on debt service, uh, they should be looking to uh, use those resources effectively and disclose how they're using the additional resources. Uh, that way, the world is more comfortable with the moratorium. So that gives you an example. But I I want to stress 
the importance of uh, of transparency in this. It doesn't take added effort by the governments. I mean, some some added accounting, uh, but the World Bank can help with that with the technical assistance side. It takes a resolve by the country to actually disclose what the people are getting for them for their their debt service. Right. In the end, whether or not a country is over indebted has a lot to do with how productively are you are using that capital, right? C correct. If there, I'm in, in fact, I'll, I'll make that point more forcefully. Debt is in general good if you're able to uh, use it for a project that pays a positive return. That's uh, a whole theory of finance that I, I, you know, I, I think is is a real part of the world. Uh, but so far, a lot of the debt was taken on and the, the projects really didn't end up paying off in the end for the people. They might have paid off somewhat for the financiers, uh, but what we need is projects that actually allow people to create more businesses in their own country. And that's, that, I think, can be benefited from uh, transparency. I appreciate that. Now, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to get your take on the global protest, the civil rights movement that's sweeping, well, the United States, but also lots of other countries. Um, you know, people who may not be so familiar with the World Bank you may not realize your offices are so close to the White House, you could probably see the protesters in the street. Um, what has it meant to you to see this the civil rights movement burgeoning around the world? And, and what do you think it means for the work of the World Bank group itself? Um, well, it, it, it presents immense challenges. One is, uh, and, and what we've done in the World Bank is having a strong internal dialogue with employees of all levels within the bank about uh, racism, uh, about the uh, racism in the, in the bank, which we accept that that still is a, is a, uh, uh, is a factor within the bank, different people feeling differently about people of color. Uh, and, and that there's no place for that in the bank. So that's one part of what we're, the, the, we're, we are working on improving on. We can make improvements uh, in our own culture. Uh, uh, just this morning had a, a meeting with our task force. We've set up a task force to uh, try to uh, have an open dialogue and allow all of us to listen to each other on this. In addition, we want to make sure that in our interactions with clients that we have a strong, uh, effective interaction that that racism doesn't it has no place in the world in general. Uh, and, and then we also want to work in our communities. So for example, the World Bank headquarters is in Washington, DC. So Washington, DC is a community that's struggling with this, uh, with this pernicious uh, uh, problem and how, how to move forward on it. From the standpoint of our operations, uh, we are uh, still working from home. And so people have been effective at, uh, at altering their daily lives and making that work. And so we're going to be uh, able to provide services for clients. Uh, and you know, we're doing that every day, uh, I think, effectively. And the, the challenge of, uh, of uh, 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 having a an inclusive workplace, a non-racist, a respectful workplace is something that we, we want to, I mean, that's a permanent part of how the bank uh, works. We, I'm, I'm fortunate to have an organization that has spent years trying to improve in these areas. For example, uh, women are, are in all, all of our senior management, junior management, all, all, all through the bank. Uh, half of our senior managers are, are women and diversity is a core aspect of what the World Bank has tried to, uh, uh, has tried to create and we're working to, um, to do even, to do better on that and recognizing that we have some, some severe challenges. W one of those, I'll give you an example, but this is, th this is a real challenge, is as World Bank uh, people work in countries that, uh, that are challenging, uh, then it, it makes it a very difficult uh, situation sometimes for a person of color uh, to, to be operating and to be, uh, to be 
uh, uh, to 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 uh, face the the living the daily living challenges. So that's something that we want to uh, work hard on and make it work much better than we have. One of the big themes that I hear a lot from Black colleagues in the in the development community is this idea of decolonizing development. That our whole industry, the structures of it, including institutions like the World Bank, are part of this yeah. kind of colonial history. Does that does that theme resonate with you at all? The idea that we should take a close look at, at even our own structures as a development community more broadly. Um, I, you know, I, I think we need to listen and and learn and think about th those issues. An another another one is setting or, or and I'll, I'll give you one aspect of this setting standards or uh, uh, even within uh, within the bank. And I think it's true kind of worldwide. Oftentimes minorities don't. Uh, think they're doing as well as they actually are within their job. So we have really high achievers within the bank. And when you do the the blind survey inside the bank of how well do you think you're doing in your job, uh, there's there's a uh, there's a self. Uh, uh, self-evaluation that's not as accurate as we would like it to be, that you're really a high performer, but you, but you don't know. And I, 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 I think that can go to the developing countries as well, that there, that there are some that have made great strides uh, and, uh, and we need to applaud that and reinforce that, that, that it, the world proves over and over again that People everywhere have geniuses. They have chances to advance. Uh, they have uh, people that are that are outstanding in every field. And so I think we can do more to to uh, to recognize that and applaud it and build it. Well, listen, I, I could talk to you for hours, David. I, I'm looking at the clock, and I know we've got to let you go. But I want to say how much we appreciate hearing your take on all of these issues. We got to a lot, but there's a lot more to continue in a conversation in the future. And I look forward to that. I will tell you also, I've been hearing from many of your colleagues at the bank about just how hard they are working. You've alluded to that a couple of times here. I know this is a particularly intense moment for, uh, for colleagues at the bank and certainly appreciate all of their efforts to try to help countries get through this moment that we're all in. Ab absolutely. I'm very proud of people, but also we try to say uh, both, both encourage but also find a balance uh, and make it work. Uh, and I think it is, you know, the, out, the results have been, have been good and client, the client feedback has been uh, amazing. So uh, thanks for that. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody who's been joining this conversation around the world. Look out for more. We're going to continue to have these discussions and come to DevX for more analysis about what's happening at the bank. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Stay thanks, safe. Thanks, Raj. Bye-bye.